Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. My name is Felix Shipkovich and today I will be your presenter uh, on the webinar discussing the exclusivity agreements in the debt settlement space. Of course, thank you for those of you who are returning um, listeners of our webinar series, our podcasts, and those who, who subscribe to our firm's newsletter um, and announcement specifically on Deck Relief Watch. Uh, and to those of you who are new, I hope that uh, we will hear from you um, commentaries uh, after this webinar. And of course, uh, happy to chat with any one of you who has questions concerning this subject matter. And today we have an, an interesting subject matter um, that was specifically requested by some of the Debt Relief Watch followers uh, to, to provide an educational webinar. Um, we, we always enjoy to select the topic uh, that comes around and is being regularly asked of our um, listeners. And this is one of those topics. Uh, I think it's quite interesting today as a result of um, this issue coming up in the debt settlement space. Uh, there's there have been a number of lawsuits, there's litigation in both federal and state courts, conserving concerning exclusivity agreements or exclusivity clauses in the debt settlement space. Now, before we dwell into it, before we we dive into it, not dwell into it, but dive into it, um, let let me let me explain what we will not discuss during this webinar. I want to be careful to explain to our listeners that the discussion will be limited primarily and substantially discussing vendor relationships, specifically those involving front ends or marketing companies and their respective relationship with back ends or debt settlement companies. Exclusivity agreements can exist in, in, in um, employee employer relationships and employee agreements we'll quickly touch upon that in one of the slides during the presentation but we're not going to dive right into it because i just don't think this this is just we're going to go down the wrong rabbit hole i mean this is going to be a lot different discussion uh for those of you who are attorneys listening to me i think you could appreciate that so i'm limiting this primarily to b2b relationships right company vendor relationships I also want to distinguish it from non-compete arrangements with vendors in the B2B space and non-compete arrangements also in the employer-employee type of relationship. That is a very similar subject matter. And originally, when I was putting together the slides, I wanted to go into this subject matter because it could directly relate to the exclusivity agreements or exclusivity clauses. However, I deleted those slides because I felt that this would it would just stretch out the webinar for a little bit too long and 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 we would lose the focus. So I'm doing this quick introduction of what we're going to focus on during this webinar and what we will not. Right. Of course, um, in the future webinar series, we will focus on the other issues and and uh, certainly happy to discuss those issues as well. So, again, just to kind of. Um, an introduction to this specific webinar is to focus primarily and substantially on the B2B relationships and the specific exclusivity clauses and agreements in this space. Now, um, I'll leave this on for literally 10 seconds. I'm an attorney who practices in, in the debt relief space and the fintech space. Um, and I also teach at Hofstra Law School. i teaching this is my sixth year teaching there. Um, don't really want to discuss too much of my bio. You could find it on the website. Okay. A quick plug uh, uh, for our firm's third annual regulatory workshop for debt relief industry professionals. Um, we started in 2019, uh, had a hiatus because of the pandemic, um, returned last year to Orange County. Um, and had a fantastic turnout. Uh, both events had fantastic turnout, turnout turnouts uh, from industry professionals who came from uh, legal compliance, biz dev, uh, lenders, institutional investors. Um, and I, uh, I, I from, from what I'm seeing from the numbers of those who are registering, uh, 
um, this is going to be even a, a you know, bigger event than last year. So, so quick plug for it. If you don't know much about the space, you'd like to learn more about the regulatory and legal issues, as well as also mingle with profession in the space, we hope to see you. It's going to be on November 6th and 7th in Costa Mesa, and more information could be found on our firm's website. Now, let's dive into the topics of discussion. So we have four bullet points, and I want to try to focus on these four issues. Again, this is a very limited sort of um, agenda for the um, for this webinar. We want to discuss what is an exclusivity agreement and when is it valid, right? What are the pros and cons of exclusivity agreements? Then I want to talk about exclusivity agreements in the debt relief industry, right? How they apply or do not apply or, or, or not valid. And finally, breaches of exclusivity, exclusivity, right? When, what happens if you have breaches? So let's let's start off with what is an exclusivity agreement? It's pretty straightforward. It's right there on the slide for you. Exclusivity agreements generally restrict the signer from buying, selling, or promoting any goods or services for from any person or company other than the issuing company associated with the contract. Essentially, the company or individuals work exclusively with the issue of a contract, right? So that's the exclusivity that, that you have the company and individual uh, or individual work exclusively with the issue of the contract. Exclusivity agreements tend to be included as part of another legal document or contract. Often many company owners who are excited and eager to get started in the business may overlook the clause. Now, majority of the times, and I would probably say that 98, 99% of the time, you're not going to have an exclusivity agreement. You will, have, you will have exclusivity terms. You will have terms to bind a party to an exclusivity. You're, I've seen from time to time, but extremely rarely, uh, exclusivity agreements passed across my desk. Uh, they do happen. They do happen in, you know, there are some, what I've seen, short form, meaning they're short exclusivity agreements, specifically designed for specific relationship. It doesn't mean that that's limited to that sum of space. In fact, I could tell you I've seen certain exclusivity agreements in fintech areas. I've seen them specifically between salespersons selling software products for some of my technology companies, okay? I've seen them. And, and there, there's a reason behind it why they're limited to actually calling it exclusivity agreements. But, but generally speaking, exclusivity will be limited to the terms that are in an agreement, right? When it's an independent contract agreement or marketing agreement or sales agreement, whatever it is, it's literally going to be limited to that specific clause. Now, clearly, the descri describing an exclusivity agreement is the simple part. For those of you who know me, I obviously will provide my own opinion on the subject matter. Generally speaking, exclusivity agreements are frowned upon by the courts, by regulators. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult to enforce one. Um, I can tell you that the subject does come up quite a lot with non-compete agreements, right? And we said we're not going to discuss non-competes during this webinar. But when there's a non-compete and or exclusivity arrangement or restriction, those are very difficult to legally maintain. And I'm going to provide you the reasoning why. We'll discuss it through the remainder of the presentation. Generally, courts do not want to see individuals be restricted. They do not want to be individuals be restricted, companies be restricted from being able to move away in the event um, that there are better opportunities. Generally speaking, and this is not a political issue, it's not a party line, it's not a partisan issue. Generally speaking, judges and both federal and state courts will allow companies to have flexibility unless the consideration that's given in return for this exclusivity is so grandeur that it will enforce the contract on its terms. It will enforce that exclusivity. So there has to be that grandeur of exclusivity consideration paid. Otherwise, I've seen this over and over again. I've seen this in non-compete agreements as well when it's just not possible to restrain 
an individual, when an employee, or an, or contractor from from maintaining a, a living, a, you know, maintaining their business, his or her business, uh, by 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 just being stuck with one company, right? Now, it doesn't mean that they are illegal. It doesn't mean that there are no circumstances when exclusivity agreements will not be enforced. But when the client, my clients ask me, can we have an exclusive arrangement with a vendor? I say, sure, but why? Explain to me what and how you will benefit and then tell me what and how that arrangement, right? Could meet the grandeur test. How can you convince in case the arrangement would be tested through a judicial precedent that it could withstand the judicial precedent's scrutiny and withstand it. And you could say that this agreement, the exclusivity of the, of the arrangement will, will withstand in the court of law and you can convince a judge. So, so it's not, again, I want to reiterate, it's not per se, not illegal, not allowed. It's just the general, generally courts will not entertain them unless they're specific grandeur considerations, right? So, so that's what we're going to basically discuss. How do we find these considerations in these agreements? Right? When are they valid or not? So an exclusivity clause mandates that the parties who have signed are legally restricted to sell or purchase goods to or from a single party. The buyer is restricted from promoting, buying, or using similar products from any other vendor or provider. And this clause could apply in several situations, including franchise, distributorships, distributorships, and business opportunities. Now, I don't typically read, if you know from my webinars, I don't typically read the language from my slides, but I want to be very carefully read this and read this slowly, right? If you are drafting an exclusivity clause, if you're an attorney or if you are in a business operate, if you're in operation, a biz dev, and you say, I want to be able to have an exclusivity with this a contractor with this vendor. This vendor bring, would bring significant opportunity to our company. And in return, I'm willing to compensate this vendor in such a way where it will be worthwhile because this vendor would be able to get a lot more by being this exclusive vendor with us, right? I actually will give you an example where that type of exclusivity actually exists on the regulatory side, it actually exists. So again, it's not per se that it's not allowed. When I was a general counsel of a of a commodities brokerage, and this was you know two decades ago, there's a designation in the commodities industry of of individuals or companies that introduce business to brokerages. They're called referring brokers or introducing brokers. Actually, exactly the same thing as front ends do, marketing companies doing that supplement space. So they call them brokers, right? They're introducing brokers. And an introducing broker could be an independent broker, or it could be uh, a guaranteed introducing broker. Literally, the word is guaranteed. What that means guaranteed is that you can only introduce your clients to uh, dealers, commodity dealers, to one commodity dealer. Let me be specific. One commodity dealer. But they will guarantee you. It means they take all the responsibility in case of your non-compliance, in case of any, mis any, any potential misleading information. They are ultimately responsible. It almost creates that parent-child relationship, right? You know, it puts a lot of um, pressure on the dealer to supervise that broker. And the same thing exists in exclusivity arrangements, right? If you're entering into an exclusivity arrangement, you need to be aware, you need to be aware that you will be held accountable for that exclusivity if you are the, let's say, the debt settlement company or the back end, right? You will be held accountable. You will be held accountable regardless you know, obviously because of the rise of investigations, litigation, but if you have an exclusive arrangement, you can't say you weren't, a, you, you, you didn't, you know, have the time to, to oversee um, marketing materials or, um, you know, mailers or however they're getting clients into the, you are ultimately responsible, right? So you can't escape that. Right. And I think that's a very important point to make. So if you are saying I'm willing to take that risk, I'm willing to take the responsibility because I think this exclusivity could be 
great for my debt settlement business, right? And again, I'm focusing more on the debt settlement side of space. And this front end, a marketing company, right? You know, my love for the word front end, which I absolutely can't stand, but, but I'll use it for the sake of these webinars. I want this front end, this front end, I'm giving this front end an amazing deal. They can't get this anywhere else, but I want to have that exclusivity. You need to have the amount of time and that exclusivity will be in effect. And I could tell you that the longer courts will generally frown upon when the, when the exclusivity is long. I have seen in this space, exclusivity time being 10 years old. Um, I, I mean, I've seen agreements with some of the backends who have said 10 years old. I do not agree that the 10 years old will withstand the courts. I, 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 I've researched this in many different states. I know that some of these companies operate on the West Coast, but I could tell you that it's very difficult to bind someone for, to exclusivity for 10 years, right? I've seen courts enforce agreements that generally exclusivity runs for one, two, three years. But when it goes into a decade, that is a very difficult argument to make. It's a very difficult argument to make with a straight face to a judge. The judge, my client, restricts this person to work from anybody else for a decade. Decade. I mean, just think about the, the, the length of that. I mean, a decade ago, okay, we, had, we, we, we were basically two presidents ago in this country. That's, that's an enormous amount of time. Right. That's an enormous amount of time. In 2012, we were just recovering from the Great Recession. Think about this. Right. So the amount of time is very, very important. And, and if a client is insisting on having an exclusivity and we discuss how I really do not think it's great to do that, I always recommend that you have an exclusivity for a shorter period of time, because ultimately, ultimately, you will be held accountable for that front end the marketing company. Okay. And you will be held accountable in that litigation. Okay. And of course, all of these issues we could talk about, uh, you know, for those who are attending the webinar or the, the, the in person workshop. Now, next, whether the company wants to name competitors to narrow down the playing field. Again, very important. When I've seen this litigated, when I see judges, as, you know, dissect these, when they're all arguments, they, you, you know, it's clearly if you're a debt settlement company, you want to say, we don't want you to work with the following three companies, right? But you also have to be thinking about this if you want to narrow down, obviously, the industry, but let's, obviously, the third bullet point is obviously almost like moot because we're talking about that settlement space. But then the geography, geographic location, because if you're basically saying, if you're located in, I don't know, I'm going to pick a random location, Hartford, Connecticut, not that I know anybody, but as an example, Hartford, Connecticut. And let's say there are, two other companies that are based in Hartford, Connecticut, and you're saying, I do not want you to operate in, in Hartford, Connecticut, and, and the other three companies that operate in, within like a 50-mile radius, you could be restricting, you could be restricting the, the, that person's ability to make a living to, to do business. And, and I just think that, um, you know, you need to kind of do that assessment are there more than three companies? If there are 10 companies, then you're only restricting three. So you're not really prohibiting that vendor from, from, from doing, um, um, from, exp from continuing to, to make a living, right? You have to look at the obviously totality of facts, also how long this front end of marketing company has been in business. But okay, so that's, that's kind of, that's, these are the four prongs that are typically should be considered. Uh, when 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 drafting an exclusivity clause in a B2B scenario, right? In exchange for an exclusivity agreement, the company should seek clear term and overall performance, right? Because if you're saying we want you to be exclusive, you also want to make sure that there's performance. And then there's an interesting question. Well, what happens if there is no performance from this exclusive arrangement, right? What happens if, for instance, today you're generating a thousand files Next year, this exclusive uh, company, this uh, exclusive marketing company or front end is generating a thousand files. But in year two, it drops down to a hundred files. It dropped tenfold. Well, what do you do? Can you terminate this as a debt settlement company, as a backhand? And the question is also, if you can terminate this, and it's a very one-way type of clause, 
I could tell you, it could be challenging courts. I've seen courts frown upon it from a B2B level. So you want to have clear terms and overall performance, right? And you also want to make sure that the other party that's saying, I will give you that exclusivity. I agree not to do business with anybody else. No one else who's your competitor. I agree that I will you know, only send business to you that that company actually performs. Because if that company doesn't perform, then the exclusivity could be problematic, right? Then obviously you have to take into consideration the economic environment, the regulatory environment, and everything else. You need to think of three things. And I really narrowed it down when discussing the subject matter with clients. Term, time, place. Term, time, place. TTP. Term, you want to be concise. Timing, right? When the performance, what, what needs to be done, how it's going to be performed, right? What are the deliverables? And place, the geographic location, okay? Let's move on. If we go back historically, if we go back historically, the Supreme Court over a century ago has a pine in this issue and has actually created what is called the rule of reason in exclusivity arrangements, right? So this is a 1918 case. This is the Board of Trade of City of Chicago versus the U.S. You know, it's funny because like as a side comment, um, you know, everybody in the space thinks that case law well, not everybody, many people in the space arises out of debt relief products. And the short answer is no. It's, it's kind of incredible how the financial services, the banking industry, the commodities industry has developed significant amount of judicial precedent, um, both federal and state level, that affect this, this particular space. Now, the rule of reason, directly from the Supreme Court case that you see on the slide. And I'm going to read it. And I think it's important to read every single word in this rule of reason. The true test of legality is whether the restraint imposed in such as merely regulates and perhaps thereby promotes competition or whether it is such as may suppress or even destroy competition. To determine the, that question, the court must ordinarily consider the facts peculiar to the business to which the restraint is applied. The condition before and after the restraint is imposed, the nature of the restraint and its effect, actual or probable, the history of the restraint, the evil believed to exist. Can you believe that the Supreme Court used the word the evil believed to exist? The reason for adapting the particular remedy, the purpose or and sought to be attained are all relevant facts. I think this is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant that in, in 1918, the Supreme Court specifically touched upon many of these issues. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Okay, let's continue. Now, as I mentioned, we'll briefly touch upon the exclusivity clauses in employment agreements. I have been involved in a number of litigations going back to probably about 15 years ago uh, even when I was a general counsel where companies tried to go after employees that left the, when I was a general counsel, a commodities brokerage we left them for a different brokerage and they tried to, and, and, you know, we tried to go to court to stop them. And, and this was specifically limited to extremely senior employees like board of directors, officers uh, who had trade secrets or any employees that had trade secrets. And, and, and obviously the irreparable and imminent harm of the exposure of these trade secrets could be, quite significant, okay? So um, uh, in employment agreement, you, you know, it is very difficult to, to sustain and enforce a non-compete clause. You could sustain it. I've actually been successful in one case, particularly, uh, this is about 2011, 2012, um, convinced to get a TRO against the company that uh, solicited our clients, uh, key salespeople, where the competitor came into that city, this was New York City, and did not have any presence and basically just raided the, the entire sales floor of one of my competitor and really the key salespeople, not, not the ones that don't generate any business. 
But overall, the, the, you know, the courts and the executive part of the branch, as you can see here, uh, the president Biden himself is now taking significant steps to the White House to really eradicate the use of these non-competition or exclusivity clauses in employment agreements. So really, again, we, we, this, this, this deserves a completely different webinar, a completely different uh, you know, subject matter. I, I just don't think it's, it's worth uh, the time to, to really spend that this, this is just a very, very different subject matter. Now, the types of exclusivity agreements in the debt relief space, right? Um, now, so in the debt relief space, I've seen a number of agreements that where the companies, the debt settlement companies, the backhands wanted to restrict front ends from doing business with others. And I mentioned a few minutes ago, I've seen as long as 10 years, a 10 year restriction. I mean, frankly, I, I, I just think it's a very difficult argument to argue. Um, I think that there's not a lot of precedent that would sustain the 10 year restriction. Um, I've seen agreements where front ends were restricted to go to anybody else until certain conditions are met. So there was an exclusivity that basically had certain conditions. So if you do not meet certain uh, guidelines, if you're not sending certain amount of business, that then that exclusivity would essentially run run out and and uh, it would end, right? And I think that made me feel a lot more comfortable, right? Because then the, the amount of time in those conditions created basically a mutually agreed and you, you know generally non-contentious clauses, right? And the compensation was actually slightly significant more than I've seen in other industry, in other in the similar situated circumstances and in this industry. Um, and and then you know again you have to look at whether the company wants to limit the exclusivity to certain competitors, particularly industry. So I've seen the exclusivity work well when you're restricting specific companies, right? Um, the debt relief space is very is concentrated in a key few key geographic locations. So if you're going to put a geographic restriction and say you can only solicit business to to companies outside of my state, again, the, and you can't do it in your state in this specific geographic concentration, I think it's problematic. I think it may not sustain um, the, the judicial review, just being very candid in terms of everything that I've looked into on this subject matter, okay? The pros and cons of exclusivity, we'll quickly go through this. You could limit your contracting partner's ability to work, right? Basically saying, hey, you can't work for anybody else. But then you, you know, you can control the type of services delivered to the market. Essentially, right, they become an extension of you. So if you if you're big on providing, you know, compliant products and services, then in this case, you 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 know, you might want to as a debt settlement company as a back end to say, this exclusivity is important to me because we we want to make sure that uh, the the types of service is nothing less than stellar. Of course, you will be responsible for any mistakes of that front end, but but you know you are able to control because you're able to usually, you know, usually. I mean, in fact, I demand that there will be audit requirements and you know in these exclusive arrangements in the B two B scenario in this space. The cons are you're basically putting you know your your partner at a financial disadvantage. You could be, right? Which means that at some point they could lose that interest to solicit business. And if you don't have a condition on certain milestones, otherwise the otherwise the exclusivity is terminated, you, you could put them at a disadvantage. A disadvantage is when you see that you're putting one party in peril, again, look look in the eyes of the courts, right? The judges that are reviewing the the briefs that are filed typically in, the, in, the case, in these type of cases and that that plays an important role right that you're putting somebody in peril um negotiating exclusivity costs could lead to a lot more complicated complicated contracting part process it's always a very sensitive topic i mean we've we've negotiated these clauses uh, on both sides of the spectrum it's always one of those things like non-compete uh, exclusivity, they're always very sensitive. And it makes sense. It really makes sense because anytime you have a restriction of any sort, a legal restriction, it creates a level of discomfort. And ultimately, like I said, you're responsible for your uh, contractor, right? I mean, you're exclusively responsible. So um, 
the pros and cons, let's continue, right? Uh, you know, is this, you need to ask yourself questions. Can you sustain a judicial review? Uh, what happens if I put myself in the shoes of this person? How long is this facility? Uh, what exactly am I prevented from doing? Uh, what either what either company sold or goes into bankruptcy, right? So if you're front end and, and, and you have an exclusive arrangement and the DSC goes into bankruptcy, well, you might not see commissions, right? That's also problematic. I mean, regardless of what the exclusivity arrangement exists, but again, you, your hands are tied, right? If you're an independent uh, front end, you, you know, you you work with different companies and if you lose, uh, you know, commission because one of the company becomes insolvent or goes into bankruptcy, you, you know, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, but that's a very important consideration for front ends. Cost versus rewards, right? It's I, I always say, both sides need to look at it. It's not just the one-sided arguments. I, I can't tell you how often I have the, that some of the companies just look at it. Yeah, I just want to tie down the uh, front end, but but they never think about the the costs, right? What and the costs? I don't mean financial costs. I'm talking about regulatory costs, liability costs, and we are, in, you know, in the U.S. is a very litigious country, so I think that the core, the word costs has to include that. Um, you know, and finally, it's important to make sure you fully understand the terms of your exclusivity. And so on the final, you know, kind of rounding out the webinar about the exclusivity, then there are breaches, right? And so litigation in, in this subject matter comes up when you basically have breaches of, of exclusivity or breaches of non-competes. Again, I'm not talking about non-competes, but breaches. You know, they, they usually the disputes don't uh, don't take place when, you know, it's kumbaya for both parties, right? Usually when one of the parties says, I've had enough, I want to get out, um, whether they're doing so, you know, vocally or they're doing it in a hush way and the other side finds out and they end up, end up prosecuting them. So, um, you know, you, you know, what are your remedies? You know, you obviously should have in your contract contractual penalties, right? You want to spell out what exactly your loss is going to be for breaching the contract, right? What are your damages, right? Not just some random number, but I, you know, I always tell to a client, look at what your potential damages will be, because that's going to be an easy way. We could talk about consequential or, you know, other type of uh, punitive damages down the road or any type of, especially if there's ill intent, uh, you know, but um, damages is an important calculation. Like how much time is it going to cost you to recoup the losses in case this exclusivity is broken, right? Um, in some cases, you know, and, and I think that's a good idea, you always want to negotiate an exit option, right? And the word option is a very important word that is usually um, missed. Um, an exit option will basically allow one an ability to say, hey, I will pay your premium to get out of the contract. So for instance, if you're front end and you say, you know what, I'm getting better deals, but I but I have an option, I'll pay you X number of dollars to to walk away from this exclusivity. I think that's a really good suggestion, right? It's a good idea to have that option. On the on the debt settlement side, same thing. If you are expecting X and that X is not being delivered, delivered to you, you want an option to get out of it. And maybe and that option should have some consideration. It doesn't have to cost you if you do a C, DSC, but it, if you're drafting the agreement, you don't want it to be that you're just, you know, hey, you didn't reach this number, so therefore, you know, take a hike, right? It shouldn't be this way. You should assume that you're going to be before a judicial review and, and even paying a small premium to terminate the agreement or to, 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 to somehow limit the, the non-compete or exclusivity may actually give you some brownie points with judges. Okay, I've seen that all, I've seen judges pay very close attention to that. You know, they don't like one-sided contracts, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, then we have, uh, I mean, you obviously wanna have arbitration clauses, usually what I try to tell you, and penalties and damages. So that wraps up. Our discussion of exclusivity contracts. Uh, this is a list of services our firm provides. Uh, you can find more on shipgrievage.com or on debtreliefwatch.com. You should subscribe, it's free. Thank you uh, for uh, participating. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Here's my email address.
And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future webinars and our future presentations, and hopefully see you in Costa Mesa on November 6th and 7th. Thank you.